All right, folks, uh, thanks for coming today. Um, my name is uh, Seth Zawilla, and I'm involved with the American Constitution Society, who's uh, sponsoring today's event. Um, we're joined today with Walter Schaub, who is the former director of Office of Government Ethics, and he's joining us from Washington, D.C. today. Um, so Mr. Schaub was appointed by President Obama to head the Office of Government Ethics in 2013. And um, this, earlier this past year, due to some ethics issues we're going to talk about, uh, decided to leave and join the Campaign Legal, uh, campaign legal Center. And so, as well, we're joined with Professor Painter, who is a professor at the Law School of Ethics and was the former chief White House counsel, our ethics chief counsel uh, for President George Bush. So, first off, thanks for joining us here today. And I guess if we could start with you, Mr. Schaub, uh, what was it like being the office, uh, the director of the Office of Government Ethics? What was it like? Well, there's the before and the after, right? <laughs> um, ooh, the volume's really loud on this, sorry. Can you hear me okay now that I just mess it up? <laughs> so, um, first of all, thanks for having me here. Um, what was it like? You know, I have to go back further than just the past couple of years. I, except for a two-year break where I, where I was at a law firm, I had been at OGE since October 2001, short, <laughs> shortly after the 9-11 attacks, and um, Worked with Richard when he was in the Bush administration. Worked with Norm Eisen, who came after him in the Obama administration. And during that period of time, I'd say the two administrations that I worked for really convinced me that ethics has no party. These guys, whatever you think of their policies on either side, really seemed indistinguishable in terms of their strong commitment to the ethics program. And they were particularly committed to OGE and provide, provided the needed leverage to get our jobs done. OGE, as, as the world has sort of learned over the past several months, really lacks any enforcement power. But in the ordinary times, it doesn't need any enforcement power of its own. Because if we ran into a problem with an individual appointee, or an individual agency, we'd call up somebody like Richard in the White House Counsel's Office, and usually by the next morning at the latest, you'd have somebody on the phone asking, okay, what is it you need us to do from that agency? Uh, because they'd been taken out to the woodshed by Richard or his counterpart in the next administration. And um, so the system worked, and it worked as a prevention mechanism by not having to get involved in enforcement and by having thugs like Richard take care of our problems <laughs> for us, um, we were able to focus on prevention and I think we did that well. Now, you know, the rest is history because that changed abruptly this um, year. Uh, interestingly though, I would say we got off to a different kind of start than it wound up being. Uh, we had spent five months working with other agencies and with a nonprofit called the Partnership for Public Service to prepare both campaigns for the presidential transition, which is a monumental undertaking. You have 10 weeks to stand up an entire government. And uh, the, Trump the Trump transition team was actually a really great bunch of people who were really committed and really earnest to trying to do it right. And I think the rest of the world would be, would be surprised by how nicely the people from the Clinton camp and the Trump camp played in the sandbox together while we were preparing them for the transition. Uh, but they all disappeared the day after the election. I sent them a congratulations email. We planned to talk later that afternoon. And then they were gone. And from that point on, they were led by a White House counsel who just is openly hostile to the ethics program. And then the president himself refused to resolve his conflicts of interest. And then went further, didn't just not resolve them, but has been using the presidency to advertise them. As we saw last night when he was giving a speech to the entire world from North Korea, and he paused us to tell us about his wonderful golf course and the tournament that they had there. Um, and so I'd say the experience of working at the Office of Government Ethics was very different this year than it had been in both Republican and Democratic administrations prior to this year. So Professor Painter, how does the experience match up with your time as Chief Ethics Counsel for President Bush? 
Well, I haven't had the experience of being uh, chief ethics counsel for President Trump. I don't think I'm going to either. Um, <laughs> I don't think I last too long. Uh, but you, you see a very unflattering picture of you guys me there. That's the expression I'd have on my face if I caught someone with their hands in the cookie jar. And, uh, you know, we'd, we'd make it pretty clear in the Bush administration if I found out if people came to me and asked my advice, uh, I told them exactly what they need to do. Now, we had some people who didn't always come to me when they should have. For example, they wanted to fire some U.S. attorneys and a couple other scandals. But so things weren't perfect under President Bush or under President Obama. Uh, but it's, it's like night and day, the attitude that you get. Uh, I never would have written a letter to the Office of Government Ethics saying, you know, the ethics rules that you have promulgated <laughs> do not apply to the White House staff. That was the response uh, from the White House ethics lawyer to a complaint from Walter about the fact that Kellyanne Conway was uh, selling, uh, uh, was uh, shilling for um, Ivanka clothing, an uh, official capacity interview on Fox and Friends. Now, that may be relatively minor offense, I don't know, but you know, the whole notion that uh, a, uh, the OGE ethics rules don't apply to the White House staff. Uh, I mean, that really is a great big middle finger to the OGE, and that's what they've basically been giving you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I'm very frustrated with it. Um, and uh, there have been a number of other occasions uh, where they've just ignored uh, the basic ethics rules. They're insisting that Carl Icahn could be, a, I guess, a volunteer. I don't know what he was. He said he wasn't a federal employee, and yet they gave him an official title as advisor to the president. That sounds like a White House title. And he's run around advising on deregulation of energy companies that he owns stock in. I mean, what kind of deal is this? And they said, well, he doesn't get paid to do that. Well, yeah, because he's cleaning up and he can deregulate. <laughs> Company owes hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stock in. Uh, it's just time after time, it's been a struggle. Uh, and I think the tone is set at the top when the president refused to divest his conflicts of interest. So, Mr. Mr. Schaub, I mean, in the Trump administration, we've had the highest concentration of billionaires of any U.S. administration before. I mean, kind of these concerns and these frustrations that Professor Painter's talking about, what was it like bringing that to, you know, trying to detangle this mess with the incoming Trump yeah. administration? Well, it certainly seems like it's the highest concentration. I haven't done a historical study of the Miller Fil Millard Fillmore administration, so I don't know going back to the 1800s, but certainly in modern history, um, that's an interesting thing, and it's one of the few areas where we really were successful in holding a line at OGE, and the prevention mechanism still did some good. Um, you, um, to understand this, you have to understand that when nominees are sent up to the Senate um, by, the, by the administration, they first go through an FBI background investigation, they go through OGE working with them on their financial disclosure and their conflicts of interest, they go with the legislative people at the agency they're going to through the Senate questionnaire forms, and it's just a mountain of paperwork they have to fill out. Um, we were able to work with them. We, we had spent years refining our systems and automating a lot of processes, creating new educational materials. And despite the fact that these nominees were much wealthier than the ones we had seen before, we were able to process their reports faster than we had during the same period in the Obama administration with nominees who didn't have anywhere near the wealth or complexity of conflicts of interest. Um, and that despite the fact that people in the White House kept lying and issuing statements to the press that we were somehow sabotaging them and slowing them down. And I warned the White House Counsel's Office that every time they do that, I'm gonna release statistics that'll show we're moving faster. And time and again, it happened. Now, I think to be fair to the folks in White House Counsel's Office, I don't think they were the ones talking to the press. I think this White House is unusually disunified and has different power centers in the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. And so people go on camera and say things like OGE is slowing us down. Uh, at one point, Sean Spicer told Politico that, uh, that OGE was somehow blocking Anthony Scaramucci when the truth is we had never heard his name until we read that article. Um, and so it was just unbelievable that just the departure from reality that was coming out of their mouths. But we moved these nominees faster and we did a good job of resolving their conflicts of interest. 
Now, some recent articles have raised questions about whether they were truthful in their reports, and I think if that turns out to be the case, then that's a big gap that was missed, and it wasn't anything we could do because we didn't have either the, the mandate or the power to go and investigate whether it was truthful. The whole purpose of them being public is so that reporters and the public will catch them. Uh, and in reality, how do you prove a negative? How do you prove that somebody left something off a form unless you call every bank, every broker, every human being on earth and say, does this guy have any business deals with you? Uh, and then do that for 4,000 people coming into the administration. Um, but we did a good job, and that's why of all the scandals that you're hearing, you're not hearing about conflicts of interest specifically in terms of actually disclosed assets from a lot of the cabinet officials. Uh, there's been some recent questions about a shipping company that uh, uh, one cabinet official has held on to. But I'd remind you that what the law requires is recusal, not divestiture. And so we managed to put recusal or divestiture in place for each of these things. Um, and, and that was more like business as usual. But then there's the White House. And unlike nominees, their reports don't go through OGE first. They come into the government, serve for 30 days, and file their financial disclosure report or they get a 45-day extension and another 45-day extension, and then the White House takes months to, to review them. Earlier this week, I looked online, and I did not see a new entrant not a financial disclosure report for Steve Bannon, even though he came to government on January 20th. So I don't know what's going on there. Um, but the point is, OGE did not get these financial disclosure reports before they came in. And so I think you have a, a dichotomy where you have the folks out at the agencies who have managed to resolve their conflicts of interest and have ethics offices that care about government ethics and have career staff trying to steer them the right way. And then you have the White House where you have the guy that, that Richard just mentioned who sent that crazy letter saying ethics applies everywhere but the White House. And, um, and OGE not able to review their reports. And in fact, one of the things that led to my decision to leave was that they were refusing to tell us what these individuals do for a living. So I only had half the picture, assuming they even truly filled out their financial disclosure report correctly. I had their financial assets, but I didn't have any information about what they were doing. And a conflict of interest is when you compare two different interests. I only had one of the interests. Uh, but to stand up and say, I'm not going to certify any White House reports, even though I can't point to a single concrete conflict of interest, I would have just looked completely partisan and would have lost that battle. And so I, I had a choice facing me, and the question was, was I going to stay, put my stamp of approval on a financial disclosure report that represented the notion that there were no conflicts of interest, when in fact I couldn't know that, and, or leave. And when presented with a choice between being window dressing for corruption or leaving and, and preserving what integrity I could, it was time to leave. Um, so kind of bringing it to today then, right, with, you know, recently within these past couple of days, we found out about that Special Counsel Mueller has been very active in these investigations of these kind of ethics loopholes um, in the Trump administration and allegations of Russia collusion. I mean, I guess we'll start, you know, I want you both to address this, but Professor Painter, what do you think is going on in the White House right now? What would you be doing? Right? Um, I don't know what's going on in the White House. I think <laughs> <laughs> this is scared of that guy. Um, you know, the problem is uh, the low-hanging fruit in the investigation is when people lie to the government. 18 United States Code 1001, false statements, that's a felony. And you lie to him, you're in more trouble. But the point is a felony if they lie on a 278 now, knowingly. You've got to prove they knowingly left something off their 278. They intended to deceive in order to prosecute them criminally. But when you have omissions on their financial disclosure filings and or statements that they make uh, for security clearances, when you're asked how many times you met with the Russians and you just conveniently forget, uh, it may not have been criminal to meet with the Russians, that's another issue. We could discuss that later. But if you lie about it, then you know you just committed a crime. So um, I think he's going after people for lying. Uh, he already got one. George Papadopoulos is now going to roll on other people. I don't know. He could have been wearing a wire for the past couple of uh, months. So people are wondering, anyone who sat down with George, uh, you know, maybe a little <laughs> worried than those who didn't. Uh, but the question, who else is wearing a wire? I have no idea what's going on with Flynn. I thought he would have been one of the easy guys to prosecute for lying, once again, 
of baddest contacts with the Russians and money got from Russia as well as from Turkey. Um, I don't know, did you ever look at Flint's 278? Did he disclose all that money from Turkey on his 278? Hey, be careful, I'm wearing a wire. Oh, you're wearing a wire? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's what I think the, the low-hanging fruit here is people who lie um, and who don't disclose things. Then uh, you get into you know, the collaboration and that would be illegal maybe under campaign finance laws or if you were trafficking stolen, stolen email after the fact. Uh, then you've got money laundering issues. We know about that with Manafort and all that. Um, I mean, there, and then of course obstruction of justice, and that's another thing. In the, in the Bush White House, we've made it clear: if there's an ongoing investigation, we don't come in. Even when Scooter Levy, who was the vice president's chief of staff, got indicted, we got him out of there, but we didn't comment on a pending investigation. You don't go calling an investigation a witch hunt. That just makes people think you're guilty. Uh, and uh, you don't make all these comments. You don't threaten to fire the prosecutor. Uh, you know, Nixon had done that. It didn't work out so well for him. So we just say, <laughs> you, you don't touch it if it's a pending investigation. Uh, that's up to the prosecutors to handle that. We're going to focus on policy, and you sure as heck don't tweet about it. Now, we didn't have Twitter back in those <laughs> days, but uh, it's just amazing what's going on. So I have no idea what they're thinking in the White House. I don't think they are thinking in the White House. <laughs> you know, one, one thing you just said, Richard, um, well, two things really. One, about the security clearance forms. You know, there's a culture in the federal government of being very nervous about filling out your security clearance forms. When you fill out a financial disclosure form with OGE and submit it to them, when I was there, we actually viewed that as the first round. We assumed you were going to forget stuff and we'd work with you to keep revising it until it was correct. And um, I used to joke that nobody ever got a nominee report all the way through uh, without any edits. And uh, in fact, I was able to say, I, I, even though I considered myself an expert, I never got mine through. Now maybe my staff held me to a higher standard and was picking on me, but, but I will say with great pride, my final year I got it through with no changes. So I must have finally gotten the hang. But, but on the security clearance forms, unlike the nominee financial disclosure forms, um, you don't get a second chance. You fill it out once, and then the FBI's job is to try to disprove what you wrote. And um, so federal employees are very nervous when they fill it out, racking their brains, trying to think of everything that could possibly be responsive to the question. I remember as part of my nominee processing when I was being considered for the, the director job at OGE, I spent two and a half hours with an FBI agent in my dining room asking me questions. And I, I kid you not, at one point she said, okay, that's enough, stop. I have to look up everything you say <laughs> because I was just trying to brainstorm. They asked me at one point, do, do you know anybody from another country? And I gave her this long-winded story about a coworker who was an American and was born here in America, but also has a passport from Switzerland and wanted to tell her all about it. And she's like, all right, that's enough. Um, <laughs> and um, that's the culture, that's the norm. And to have people filling out security clearance forms, forgetting a meeting with a government official from a hostile foreign power, that's just insane to me. Um, and, um, Along the same lines in terms of departure from norms, the White House in both the Bush and Obama administrations wanted to stay as far away from investigations as possible because they were terrified of looking like they were interfering with them. So they went to an extreme level. Um, I remember one time, and I can't remember whether it was Bush or Obama administration, but I was talking to somebody in the White House about an ethics issue we were dealing with, and they mentioned that there was an IG investigation going on, and they ended the call. They did not want to be on the call even at all while an IG investigation was being mentioned because, and, and mind you, I wasn't sharing any confidential information. I was just mentioning that, that it was a reason for holding up working on something because we were waiting for the IG to complete their work. They did not in any way want it to be seen as interfering it, and now, You've got a president who's firing U.S. attorneys. And I know you mentioned Bush did that to a few, but that was a small number. And, um, and this is, you know, we've lost all of them now, or almost all of them. And he's individually interviewing them. I could tell you when I was at OGE, we would get nominee financial disclosure reports from the White House for almost every agency. 
But one agency where the president's nominees did not come to us from the White House was US attorney positions in, in DOJ. And they would come directly from the executive office of the US attorney in, in the Department of Justice because they depoliticized the process so much in the past two administrations that the White House wasn't even directly involved in the initial vetting of these. And in fact, when we were touting our statistics or how fast we were moving them, they would always say, well, don't include the, U the US attorneys because we're not involved in that. And that was the culture. So to have a president sitting down interviewing US attorneys, having his counsel of the president go to try to find out if there's a FISA warrant or to find out if they can lift a gag order on a confidential informant or to criticize the, U the, the, the attorney general for recusing from a matter that he might be a target of that investigation and um, to hint that you might fire the special prosecutor who's investigating you and to have your attorney say that if he goes and looks at my business holdings, that's really inappropriate and, and that might lead to the end of the investigation. Well, for crying out loud, talk about a red flag. Hey, prosecutor, don't look over there. Whatever you do, there's nothing to see there. Um, that I can guarantee you if I was a prosecutor, that would be the first place I'd want to look. And, um, and let's remember, what did they take Al Capone down for? We don't, we don't tend to think of Al Capone as a great tax cheat, but that's what he went down for, even though I think he did a few things that were worse than cheating on his taxes. Um, so I think the threat to the independence of the Department of Justice is the scariest thing that has happened in my entire career um, in terms of overreach of government authority and a drift towards authoritarianism. You do not use the apparatus of the state to target your political rivals. That is just about as un-American a thing as you could possibly do. So, so given, I mean, the targeting of the Department of Justice, I mean, what do you think happens if, let's say we wake up one morning, we find out that, you know, President Trump has fired, you know, Robert Mueller and, you know, has kind of more aggressively intervened in the Justice Department like you're talking about now? For me, firing Mueller is a red line. And if Mueller gets fired, I've been saying to everybody, I am out in the streets. And I hope every patriot in the country is out in the streets demanding that he be reinstated. So. Yeah, I, we, uh, I'm old enough to remember uh, Archibald Cox getting fired by President Nixon. I was only 10 years old or so at the time. But it caused quite a ruckus. And uh, President Nixon had to go through two attorneys general he had to fire two attorneys general in order to do it. The president cannot fire the press special prosecutor, only the attorney general can. So uh, 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 Attorney General Richardson refused to do it. His successor, Attorney General Buckleshouse, refused to do it. And then he got to Bob Bork, and then Bob Bork did it. Uh, that came up in his confirmation here in the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, that really uh, was the red line in the sand there. You know, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you what happened, though. Uh, there was such a ruckus that they had to put in another special prosecutor, uh, Leon Jaworski, who came in and finished the job uh, and was really just good, if not uh, better prepared for the job than Archie Cox. So, you know, I don't think that's a very good route to go. Uh, one bit of trivia that uh, uh, this man here and Archie Cox actually went to the same high school. That better not be the, that better be the only similarity between the two. I mean, they're both <laughs> two good, effective prosecutors because if President Trump fires Robert Mueller, there is going to be a ruckus, big time. And uh, if the Congress doesn't respond, we're just going to have to fire Congress. <laughs> so, so, so you think the ruckus is a combination of democratic action and you know the levers of government? And we had a great conversation. The Republican action too, unless unless they want to want to get thrown out of office. Well, so we had a great conversation, Mr. Shaw, about how does govern? I mean, does do ethics matter when you have unified government? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? You know. I remember, you know, we all sat in our civics classes in high school and heard about the checks and balances. And just as a thought experiment, imagine for five, for five seconds that the other major party candidate had won the election and did any of the things this candidate is doing right now. We would have had Benghazi-style hearing after Benghazi-style hearing over uh, the Clinton Foundation over, uh, you know, advertising the foundation in a speech in South Korea, over bringing Chelsea Clinton in as an assistant to the president. 
I mean, you can't even fathom that happening for, or being tolerated for five seconds. In fact, the attorney in the Office of Legal Counsel who wrote the memo saying, sure, ignore four decades of OLC precedent and bring Jared and Ivanka into the White House. If instead he had said, sure, do that, bring Chelsea Clinton into the White House, he would have been up there personally having to testify and explaining himself to members of Congress. And so I'm very concerned about the pressures on members of Congress when you have both parties, uh, both chambers of Congress and the White House held by the same party. And I've come to the belief that I hope that never happens again for either party. I hope neither party ever holds both chambers of com Congress and the White House again because you don't have the ability for oversight. And I have to say, I'm, I'm just convinced that there are really good people on both sides. <laughs> That's a bad phrase. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let me phrase that differently. Really good members of Congress on both sides of the aisle who care about government ethics. I've worked with them. I, you know, I had a hearing with a subcommittee chairman in December 2015 who was deeply engaged in government ethics and was asking me really insightful questions. That was uh, Mark Meadows. And, and, it, and I really had a great experience talking to him and afterwards invited him to come visit the agency because it was clear to me he cared about government ethics. And I believe he still does. And I think Charles Grassley cares, Chuck Grassley cares about government ethics. I think a lot of these people up there care about government ethics. My theory on this is that the hyper-partisan gerrymandering has created districts where you have such a polarized population and, and, so, and you, you so radicalize a district by over-gerrymandering it that I'm not sure that a lot of members of Congress right now feel free to vote their conscience and are afraid that if they do that, they'll be out. And in fact, when you see Jeff Flake and Bob Corker really heroically standing up for America and talking about uh, the fact that this is a dangerous departure. Whether you agree with their politics or not, that was a courageous thing. And I know the White House has tried to dismiss it saying, well, Flake wasn't going to win again. I think Flake had a good chance until he started speaking out against this president. And so I actually think there are really good people in both parties. I don't think it's a partisan issue. I think that Ethics really does have no party, and I am just hoping that uh, some of the members of the majority who have been afraid to speak out because of the gerrymandered districts um, will find their voice and, and speak their consciences, and, and I'm going to keep hoping for that because I know, I, ju I just know as a matter of an article of faith that there are people on both sides of the aisle up there who care about this stuff and just don't feel free to talk about it, and I think they need to recognize that this is a moment in history where our government ethics program is in danger and there's rumblings of a drift towards authoritarianism in the threat to the independence of the Department of Justice that needs to be addressed. And, and I, think, I think Chuck Grassley, for instance, uh, went on record saying you better not fire Mueller. And so I think that um, uh, we've seen evidence that a number of them when pressed hard enough by, by the circumstances are willing to speak up and I'm, I'm hoping more of them find their voice. I would, I've kept pretty careful track of what they've been doing since January 20 and I, I, I'm quite confident in my view that if Hillary Clinton had been elected and she had done exactly what Donald Trump did at each stage at the time he did it, that we would have somewhere between January 21 and January 31, someone would have introduced articles of impeachment in the House. Now, I don't know how that would have worked out in the Senate, of course. Uh, remember, her husband was impeached for lying on the oath uh, about his sex, uh, sexual life. I mean, let's not get into that. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, the, the bar can be pretty low on impeachment if the other side, if the other party controls the House. And uh, apparently, if your own party controls the House, uh, they don't even, I mean, I've, I've called down for several months for the House Judiciary Committee uh, and the Senate Judiciary Committee to meet and call some administration officials in front of the committee and testify about some of these big picture issues, the uh, uh, relationship with the Department of Justice, uh, this idea of prosecuting Hillary Clinton. I mean, we're getting really tired of the tweets about uh, uh, investigating Hillary Clinton. Uh, 
And it just goes on and on and on. And, and I think we've reached the point where we need to at least have hearings in the House and the Senate. I remember the, the, those Nixon hearings when I was a kid. Um, and uh, yet they don't seem to want to do anything. I know they're busy raising money for the campaigns, which is a priority. But, um, you know, this is a, is a very serious situation. And Congress is not taking it seriously at all, except for these senators who speak out, and they're not running account. Um, and uh, it's, it's unfortunate. So we'd like to take this opportunity to kind of bring the conversation to you guys over here now. So we've got Dante with the microphone. If you have a question, raise your hand, and we'll go ahead and ask it um, and kind of continue the conversation with you know, the audience's thoughts. No questions, really. <laughs> no, go ahead. He's got one of, oh, yeah, thanks. Hi there. Thank you both so much. Um, a lot of the debate around uh, ethics in the Trump administration has talked about uh, them being an aberration or a departure from the norm. Uh, what do you think, uh, you know, assuming, uh, you know, whatever, uh, that, you know, Democrats win or, you know, more moderate Republicans win, what do you think will not go back to normal in the next administration? That's, that's a really good question because my biggest fear that keeps me up at night is that this aberration becomes the new norm. And um, I think it's going to be really incumbent on whoever wins to exercise some self-restraint and realize that they carry a special weight on their shoulders of being the ones to return us to the norms. And, uh, and that could wind up, as you say, being either party, but whoever it is needs to, needs to adopt that attitude. And I, I think there's a particular danger that the other side could say, well, you let him get away with it, so it's okay for us to do it, and you can never again ask that question. I'm worried because um, restraint is not a quality commonly identified with victors. And so I think what has to happen now is that people on both sides of the aisle have to commit to themselves and to the public and to their peers that if they find themselves in a position of power, they are going to hold themselves to the standards that existed before this departure from the ethical norms of our society. I am concerned uh, that there uh, are people on the far left and the far right who don't uh, respect uh, legal norms, who don't believe in objective truth. Uh, it's not always hard to find out what objective truth is, but who don't believe in the notion that there's right and there's wrong. Uh, this is a popular theory among the far left in academia, all these deconstructionists, all those people, but they never got in the government. Uh, yet people like Steve Bannon, who describes himself as a Leninist, Leninist, who had that same attitude, it's the far right that took those attitudes uh, toward basic norms in the government. And that's before Trump. We had a law professor from Berkeley named John Yu, who came into the Bush White House, well, into the Justice Department, wrote a memo saying that torture was okay. And I talked about that with my class this morning. It's ironic, that's the same debate I used to have with the left-wing critical theory people. I say, oh, you guys said there's no such thing as objective truth. You gotta agree that torture is wrong. Of course, they muddle around, but you know, they're irrelevant. They're just in academia with their critical theory nonsense. In <laughs> the White House and the Justice Department opining that torture is okay, that there is no objective truth on that, just disgraceful. So we had some of this under the Bush White House, and I will acknowledge that, but it has accelerated this trend. Mm -hmm. And you have Kellyanne Conway in the White House long, she's talking about, uh, uh, well, they're alternative facts, and then making up a whole massacre out of whole cloth, the Bowling Green Massacre, what's that? <laughs> Uh, and then the microwave oven spying on you. I guess we've got a whole other scandal. That's about Obama spying on the, on the Trump Tower. And the point is there is objective truth. There's right and there's wrong. Uh, yes, 15, 20 years ago, I got sick and tired of the left wingers saying there wasn't, but they were irrelevant. They never affected the government. The right wing is taking these same theories, and by the way, the same theories were used in the 1930s in Germany. Just read, uh, there is a... Uh, a legal uh, theorist named Carl Schmitt who was using some of those same theories uh, to establish, dicta uh, to support dictatorships. So, you know, there is right and there's wrong. And we need to get back to a world in which lawyers will stand up for the truth. And at least Attorney General Sessions, as much as I disagree with him on race relations, 
Uh, and a lot of what he says about substantive law, at least he understood that he had no choice but to recuse. He had to recuse. It's right there in the ethics rules for lawyers under Rule 1.7. You cannot represent the government in a matter in which you could be being investigated. And at least he stuck to his guns on that. And I hope, I, I pray, I hope that uh, people will hold this administration accountable because I worry every couple of days that it's, they want to fire Sessions. And I don't think Sessions told the truth, by the way, in his confirmation testimony. But <laughs> I still want him in there <laughs> because I have to live with, you know, the least best alternative. <laughs> because if he gets fired, Mueller gets fired. Uh, but it, it's the whole view that power is more important than law. And that all it is about is power relationships and who has the power. And it's not. There are, we are in a country where there's a rule of law. And, and this administration is putting a great big middle finger up to the rule of law, and I'm, I'm not put up with it. <laughs> you know, one, one thing I think people could keep in mind as you hopefully push for a return to the norms of our society and the, and the ethical norms is that you have to remember that the ends don't justify the means. And we're sort of in an instant gratification, ends justify the means time. Uh, and I'm not sure that I find that to be unique to either party or even either side of, of some of these issues. Um, and I think it's really important to hold to some objective principles and say, there are things I will not do uh, in pursuit of certain ends. I mean, I for one think that torture is a moral absolute and whatever mental gymnastics the Office of Legal Counsel wants to do to get there isn't going to make it right. That's an extreme example, but there are other examples from day-to-day -day life and I think even as law students, as lawyers, or even as citizens in our society, we've got to stop and realize that if you're trying to return a country to a certain set of norms, you actually can't get there by believing the ends justify the means because you are departing from the norms in trying to push for going back to the norms. And so what you do and how you do it matters. Richard, you could provide some traveling music next time. Yeah. You know, so oh, yeah. Hum a little bit. So we've talked uh, an awful lot about returning to norms, um, and we just talked about the next election. It's, it's still three years away. In that time frame, um, is there a, a, an individual, an office, or, or, or a group that has the ability to uh, kind of rein in some of the more extreme uh, lines of thought and action that are going on um, and perhaps return some of the normalcy uh, to the government prior to a new election. So, so that's a question I hear a lot these days. Is there somebody who's going to come and save us? No one is coming to save you. <laughs> so stop waiting for them. Uh, the lesson of these times is that you have to participate in democracy and it's on you. And that's why even at a ground level, a just individual person remembering that the ends don't justify the means is important and put it pushing for a return to norms and frankly doing things like contacting your members of Congress or, or others in power and letting them know that what they do matters to you. And, and I don't mean that in any kind of partisan way because I think there are people in, in office from all backgrounds who need a little nudge once in a while. And I have to tell you, I, I've been on the receiving end of that. Um, we used to receive, on average, maybe 100 calls a year from the public. During a transition year, maybe 500. And in the first six months after the election, we received 35,000. And I wound up having to take the staff phone number list off because you'd hear the phones, people going down the list, you'd hear the phone roll like a wave around the hallway as they'd go from one to the next. So we couldn't get anything done because the, the noise was so much. And there was one point where a group, it was Greenpeace, um, <laughs> wanted to get my attention on something. And they melted our phones. We got 3,000 phone calls in one afternoon. I wound up calling him saying, enough, please stop. I'll meet with you if you just won't do that anymore. <laughs> 
so they promised not to melt our phones again, and, and we had a very cordial meeting. And uh, <laughs> uh, But I will tell you, it matters hearing from people. And I know that seems like a little thing, and I know that a lot of times you might call a member of Congress's office and they'll just figure, well, you didn't vote for my guy, so I don't, I don't need you. But you know what? We've seen that this administration responds to public pressure. And there are a number of things that they set out to do. And whether the pressure came from members of Congress um, on both sides of the aisle or whether it came from the public, they have changed their course. And so I actually think our best hope for returning to ethical norms is for the public to demand it. Uh, the Constitution provides a good answer to your question. Congress is there to be check on the executive. And the Congress needs to start taking this stuff seriously. Uh, to, just to give you an example, I mean, if somebody wants to go uh, talk about how, gee, the First Amendment is, is relative and, oh, maybe we ought to have exceptions to the First Amendment. I've heard left-wingers say that. Okay, blah, blah, blah. The President of the United States starts saying, I wish there wasn't a First Amendment. You know, I wish the press shouldn't be able to get away with saying this stuff. We take that seriously. The House of Representatives should be taking that seriously. They ought to be investigating how they've been trying to do anything to undermine the licensing of NBC. The President has threatened that in a tweet. If the House of Representatives doesn't want to do its job with respect to the Constitution, that includes the foreign government payments the President has been receiving in violation of the Monuments Clause, I don't know why I should have to go to federal court in New York to sue, and for my group, as we have, if Congress was doing its job. So th that's what the Constitution said. They have a role there. And if they don't want to do it, well, we're going to have to send them a message. And uh, we don't want to get political as a non-political group. But I can say without making any partisan statements, uh, that our members of Congress, all of them, I don't care whether it's Keith Ellison or, or, or whether it's uh, uh, some of these others, Tom Emmer, and uh, we got Jason Lewis in my district. I don't know what he's doing. But uh, the bottom line is, <laughs> if they want to keep their jobs, they got to do their jobs. And they got to get going. And look at some of that polling data coming out of Virginia last night. And some people were focusing on who the governor ought to be just on the merits. But a lot of people were thinking about Donald Trump. And uh, so I, I do have some friends in the Republican Party saying, you know, the great plan here to bail us out of this is to get Donald Trump to start endorsing all the Democrats. But um, <laughs> it, uh, because he's not conducting himself, as a president ought to conduct himself, and Congress has a job to do, they do it or they're gone. And that's the message we've got to send. Um, you know, I think another important piece is you have to reward desirable behavior. And so you may have members of Congress or members of city or local government or federal government who you don't like for one reason or the other or you don't like their politics for one reason or the other, but they do the right thing one day. If there's no reward for that and there's only stick with no carrot, no one's gonna keep doing that. And I can give you one real world example. The, um, the Obama administration had an ethics pledge. This one has an ethics pledge. This is the thing now, these executive orders with yeah. ethics pledges. And um, it imposed a lobbyist gift ban. But it also included a provision that said, consider doing um, a, a regulation that extended this lobbyist gift ban that applied to politicals to career people. And um, there were those of us at OGE who were a little skeptical about it because we felt like a gift is bad no matter who it's from, whether it's a lobbyist or not a lobbyist. So there were some theoretical differences, but OGE was a little slow in getting that reg out at, for various reasons, including a lot of debates about whether this was the right way to go. And we ultimately issued this um, proposed regulation and a, a good government group that had been a big advocate of this issued a, a, a press release, and, and I think got it published somewhere, um, that said, too little, too late. We're not interested. We're not giving you any credit for it. Well, I have to tell you, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. That reg never went forward, because the thought was there were plenty of people who didn't like it, and if the people who would have liked it were saying, not enough, we want more, there was no value in doing it from, from the political will to do it. and. Um, and there were others, again, at OGE who were, who were thinking, let's do a broader rule that applies to everybody, regardless, not just lobbyists. So they, they agreed with the idea, just disagreed with narrowing it to lobbyists. Um, and so that's an example of how that can kill it. So if a member of Congress who consistently votes a way you don't like 
stands up and gives a speech about how important the ethical norms of our society is, don't join the crowd saying, yeah, well, we hate him anyways, so forget about it. It has to be, good job, you did something right. And that's the nature of compromise, and that's the nature of democracy. I mean, if we were to move back from extremes and, and have people getting Congress moving again, because Congress is extremely deadlocked, and whether you like one side or the other, uh, the partisan gerrymandering may have, have currently given one party a majority and it might one day give another party a majority, which will be just as bad, but it, it also grinds compromise to a halt because everybody's forced into extreme positions and it prevents Congress from getting anything done. Well, getting stuff done looks like a rotten deal because you get a little bit that you like and a little bit that you don't like and that's a compromise. And a really good compromise is when nobody walks away really happy, but it's functional and it works. And so I'd like to encourage people that when somebody stands up against the erosion of our ethical and societal norms, even if they're from a background that you don't necessarily agree with or they have some ideas you don't agree with, focus on the conduct, not on the person. And if the conduct is praiseworthy, praise the conduct and, and create incentives with not just sticks but also carrots because, and I'm not talking about just psychologically manipulating people, I'm talking about actually moving toward compromise by having there be some value in, in doing the right thing. Okay, we're not gonna agree on everything but we might agree on this point. Let's pursue that point for now and, and actually accomplish something, so. So let's do one last final question over here to the right. Uh, I don't need that. Okay. <laughs> Actually, maybe you should just because yeah. they're recording it and it won't pick up. Yeah. So. Okay, should we do the music while he's trying? Oh, to yeah, play? yeah. I guess it's it. oh. Hail to the chief. <laughs> <laughs> Boy. Hi. Um, what is it about this administration that is so unethical? You know, is it just the, the commander in chief kind of, for lack of a better metaphor, trickling down onto the rest of the administration or is there more, is there more? Well, I, I think Richard's right that it starts from tone from the top, but you have a person who's held onto his financial interests, which means when he makes a decision, you don't know if it's because of his policy aims or his financial interests. So did he praise Erdogan in Turkey for grabbing additional power um, because he likes autocrats or because he has a hotel in Turkey? Did he invite the murderers Duterte from the Philippines to come stay at the, at the um, um, White House because he likes murderous Philippine dictators or did, does he have properties there? And using the White House to, advertise properties, you're paying for that, and it's millions of dollars that are going to all of these every weekend trips. To um, So the next time you go to write your tax bill, think, try to do a mental calculation, just think about how many of these tax bills would you have to pay to pay for one weekend's trip. And um, you have, as Richard pointed out, them bringing in a guy like Carl Icahn, who's so conflicted with financial interest, he could never be a federal employee unless he decided to follow that biblical admonition to give away everything you have and follow me. <laughs> um, and, um, and that's not going to happen. Um, and so they then name him a presidential advisor and give him a title. And a good article to read it if you want to really study the issue is go read the New Yorker article on Carl Icahn by a guy named Patrick Keefe, K-E-E-F-E. -E -E, and it's a real world playing out. Or we have the private prisons company renting Mar-a-Lago for an event and presumably trying to buy access to White House officials because uh, they want Jeff Sessions to keep going down this road of turning us back toward using private prisons after we'd been drawing down on that. And then go read any of the international human rights publications about what happens in private prisons. It's just an abomination. So, so we could go on with lists like that, but it affects things. It affects very real things. Or, or the next time you're squeezed into a crowded little plane like I was on the way out here today, think about Tom Price lounging on a couch on an empty airplane that has a, a wet bar and a home entertainment system at $25,000 a pop 
when he drove an hour out to Dulles Airport from DC to fly a distance that he could have driven two and a half hours to, uh, just so he could ride on that luxury plane. The man could have taken Uber and saved us money to go from DC to Philadelphia. So, so we're going to have to end it there, unfortunately, due to time constraints. Uh, but everyone, thank you so much for coming here today. Um, a huge thank you to Mr. Schaub for joining us from Washington. Um, and you know, thanks for being a part of this important conversation, our democracy. And we hope you guys carry it forward out of these halls. So thanks so much. Thanks.